Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the UAC Contemporary Gallery. I'm Jim Edwards, the director of the uh, UAC Gallery. And um, to, to uh, my right on the end, Laura Kraft, who is the director of our museum right next door. Matt Boylston, who's our dean and also the poet uh, in this uh, collaboration uh, with Michael Collins, the painter. And uh, I'll just talk briefly a little bit um, about the idea of this exhibition. And then uh, we will have Matt read his poems with Michael's commentary. And uh, then at the end of this, we will have a discussion. And we'd like to have a lot of questions come at us about, uh, about the show and about the work and how poetry can interact with painting. Is this not a new idea. This is something that has happened historically um, throughout, throughout history. And in more contemporary times, we have modern poets who have worked very closely with artists, sometimes directly, like Frank O'Hara, who, mm -hmm. who actually did some work. Um, he actually worked with Larry Rivers on some prints where Larry Rivers was doing uh, lithos with uh, Frank O'Hara's poems written onto the, onto the plate and then they were printed out. This show is not exactly that way. It's not a true collaboration because the works were done independently. Uh, Matt's poems were written um, and Michael's paintings were done separately. Some of Michael's paintings go back a ways in time. But I, as a curator, what I, what, what I was struck with was the fact that the work really has a symbiotic kind of relationship. Both uh, Michael and Matt are uh, Christian artists and they are Southern artists, one being a poet, one being a painter. And so I thought it would be very interesting to show this work together in that format. So again, uh, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm going to ask now that uh, Matt uh, read his poems, and, um, and then Michael will contribute uh, his comments based on the poems that uh, yeah, Matt's see. reading. Mm -hmm. Matt, before you read, let me just, the way Jim Edwards designed the space in the room, I'd like to share with you, in wanting more of a monastic environment, yeah. this is how the paintings should be viewed. They are from private collections around the country, and I'm sure the people there will appreciate the thought that Jim gave the way they're presented, but I just wanted to leave you with that, but Matt can't read. <laughs> <laughs> Especially illuminate material, so let's have light. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's an honor to be in a show with Michael Collins. This is uh, the first collaborative project I've done, and it's certainly the first project I've done with someone as renowned as Michael. The, um, what I thought I would do is uh, read the five poems that the works uh, that have been chosen to go with the works in the room and um, mention the painting and Michael's. We can sort of jump in and talk about the painting at the same time. We would sort of go uh, that direction. As we were putting this project together, though, I think it is uh, also worth saying um, Jim and Laura both are artists in this exhibit in their own ways as well. I, I chose the uh, poems for the show, but Laura actually chose the parts of the poems that went with the paintings as well as how to display them, and Jim and Laura worked together to, to um, have the show sort of have a cohesive whole and fit the space and all of that. So uh, really it's a four artist project, not a, not a two artist project. The uh, first poem I'm going to read is this poem um, here to your right. Uh, the name of that painting, Michael, is The Towers, is that right? Yes. And it's from 2001, uh, uh, oil painting. The, the poem that goes with it is, um, starts with the title is from uh, 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 Paul's letter to the Romans. It is not as though God's word has failed. There is a rainbow over Houston. The devil beats his wife. A clogged highway and a man and a motorcycle and a sign on an overpass blinking on and off. Drink, drive, go to jail. I know all the words to give me shelter. In third grade, I spread rumors about a kid in my class with a deformed face who lived with two women near my house. 
He wore the same gray sweatpants every day to school. Every day he came to our front door to ask if I could come out to play baseball or walk in the woods. I told everyone that he had AIDS. I called myself a Gentile until I was 10. Let's say nothing about the ATM and the narthex of a megachurch downtown. Nothing of the swipes and keypads on the offering plates. Let's say I hear the King James Bible and the voice of my first preacher, Pastor Corder, who died when I was seven. I can't remember a thing about his face, but I hear his voice every day, every hour. There is a cold case file on the death of God. On the morning after Halloween, I walk with my dad in a pine wood built on the dead body of a cotton field, row on row of neatly seated young white pine. We walk a mile or more to get out of the man-made woods and step into a clearing where the kudzu grows square around the floorboards of a rotten house. In the lacing sun, appliance doors, gray fenders, bright white sinks strewn out like gravestones in the light. An icebox from the twenties stands upright, door closed. Astonished, we open it. Inside, a glass milk bottle, unbroken, undisturbed. I break the cap and pour out clean, pure milk that has not soured. I've got you where I want you, is in his voice. Run off the road, disoriented, with a broken kick drum in my chest. A song I know comes on the radio, and I begin to sing, full-throated, at the top of my lungs, with the voice God gave me. It is not as though God's word has failed. I know all the words to give me shelter. I called myself a Gentile until I was ten. There is a cold case file on the death of God. I've got you where I want you is in his voice. Love me like I should be loved. In that reading, which is beautiful, Matt, the the idea of repetition comes to mind. As in anything we dream, often there's repeating symbols. My work as a post-symbolist deals with those things given to the viewer, those passages, those memories, those beliefs those communications with others. And this particular painting is inspired by a relationship with my father. He was a fine artist and a sculptor. The uh, forms in the painting, in this particular case, the bottom right-hand corner, has a, a marble head that he carved. He's showing in Nodlers in New York when I was a young man. And the, in the dream, the marble self-portrait is sinking into a sandy loom or a bog. In the distance, the Tower of Babel, or a tower of non-specific sorts, but yet with that classical archway providing shelter, a kind of Turkish resistance to disbelief, the Greeks, Ephesus, the idea of that Cappadocia, the feeling of those arches being important, that the spherical perfection within our lives that's connected to the very universe above us through circular rainbows written in Revelations deals with the rocks with the water, with the circumference. And like in the poem, but not intended to, the particular forms almost as in glimpses from a dream are of forms he collected of African art, of oceanic, of pre-Columbian, of things that he let go in his life. This was done two years before he passed away. So for me, it was a dream about a connection, the towers being the symbol, the metaphor of the connection, the strength that that would suggest but it also was about how those glimpses of what his life had materially were let go that sank into the bog as he, as he ascended. Thank you, Mike. The uh, next poem in the, the painting uh, over here called Jacob's Ladder uh, from 2008 to 2009 is an oil painting. Uh, the poem that Laura chose for this one is uh, Coppermouth. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, Jim talked a bit about being a Southern poet, and, and uh, I actually uh, see myself as a Southern poet very specifically and um, unapologetically. 
Uh, but I don't necessarily see myself as a regionalist point, uh, poet in any type of um, way that we usually think of it. So in, in this poem uh, that I'm going to read uh, that deals with snakes, like many of my poems do, um, uh, and is somewhat of a swampy poem, uh, I, I, I think to me this was the one that I thought was most interesting of the, of the pairings. Um, but of course, you know, we are in a Christian context, so snakes have do dual duty for us. Copper mouth. Uh, a, a copper head also in a cotton mouth are two of the four poisonous snakes in South Carolina. A rattlesnake and a um, coral snake are the other two. Uh, there is no such thing as a copper mouth. We trace divergence. We are in an old van on an old bridge looking for signs. A snake slip, a warm nest, the traces of the thought when we all were one. The earth has Alzheimer's. It forgets all it ever knew. It leaves bits and pieces of a shattered memory flashing up at us when we dig deep. The evolutionary herpetologist from the county zoo with thick waders and a rusted S-hook is down on his hands and knees peering into a dark swamp and we students fan out in all directions searching for the copper mouth, extinct ancestor of moccasin and pit viper, a slithering rumor that someone somewhere had heard tell. Our Gullah translator comes back with filtered stories and the feral bodies of two boa constrictors let loose in the swamp. But beneath the stories, there is something here, wounds that don't respond to antivenom, like a door that won't open with a key that fits, the occasional sloughed skin with patterns both foreign and familiar to ones we know, even, perhaps, two rotten fangs tacked to the rafter of a hunter's lodge. If such a species were still alive, we must find it, if only to show us the process of our combination and how different we've become if only to remind us of the God who looks down on us saying, come together all things in my name. Um, interesting, I agree with Matt, I think it's an interesting juxtaposition of the painting Jacob's Ladder doesn't necessarily and specifically relate to a biblical portent, and yet it does. There's duality in almost every painting of, of worth. This painting was inspired by trips that I took and researched to Neuengamen, Buchenwald, and Auschwitz. This particularly was inspired and intentionally left in an ambiguous state, much the same way words fall across your ear and heart, the way the intention of something can be thick and rich and full with the juices of belief, also having an entendre, also having a hook, as it were, visually, so that the viewer has to mitigate what's in their heart. And indeed, the subconscious mind pours forth to the conscious often if the painting evokes that that needs to be evoked in the viewer's mind, not necessarily just in the artist's mind. So here we have a bridge that could be a ladder, that could be a rail track, that arching upward in a classical feeling that Fibonacci would have recorded in 1.618, spiraling in a mild golden rectangle towards an illumination that's never quite achieved in its own boundary the palm tree reveling in the notion of the golden coast that we all share. But like Matt's poetry, I am not regionalist either. Most of my forms in this show are inspired from the heart of Christendom, which is Italy, from Florence and Venice and all of the realms in the heart of silence. So with this painting, and most of my paintings come from dreams. They may be inspired by places I visited or uh, remembrances of people that I've loved in my family that are related to parents. I've said about my father already. Also, my father and I, the first experiences I had were collecting rocks that he later would carve before he got to the jade specimens that were far more lengthy project to have accomplished. Because diamond cuts jade, jade's a metamorphic asbestos. So like the very act of the Holocaust, it folds into a conscious memory of the land that we can never let it forget. We can't forget those things which come before us. So I wanted to juxtapose this arching, resurrective sense of an illuminant path, of an illuminant trestle, of an illuminant ladder, 
that would arch a way through darkness into some form of hope. And in the painting, the particular processes all are different. And they're different for reasons. They're not, chose, they're not chose, in, chosen in an arbitrary fashion, but are, are intentional in the methodology to evoke the most that I can evoke from the thoughts that are in the dream. I think that, that covers it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Michael. The, the last poem on this wall is, um, the name of the painting is Rivers Divide. It's from 2012, 13 Oil. Um, this is one of the two most recent paintings of yours in this, this show, I believe. Absolutely. Uh, even though Michael's painting is most recent, this is actually the oldest of the poems. This is an early poem for me um, uh, called In the Bell Yard. Several of the topics that I tend to write about a lot, uh, other than snakes, uh, is um, one of them is the, the, the architecture and environment of the South. Whether it's a, a church, uh, particularly one of the older churches, the, the pre-revolutionary churches and colonial churches in South Carolina, or um, in another poem that, that Jim references, it's not on the show here, but is referenced in the, in the handout uh, about a gas station that my grandfather owned, and the way the sort of, the sort of South takes back its buildings uh, in a... So it, it, it really is a, a tropical environment and how it, it does that. I think you can see this with Houston, too, where there's just not a lot that's old here. Uh, conversely, those places where there's a lot that's old and arrogantly shabby, um, it does raise certain questions. And one of the, the places that this poem is set in, when I moved to graduate school in the University of South Carolina, I had an apartment over uh, close to Trinity Cathedral, which is the cathedral of the Episcopal Diocese of Upper South Carolina. It's one of the oldest churches in Columbia. It looks right over the State House, and it's uh, filled with the graves of famous South Carolinians, the three uh, Wade Hamptons, and uh, but also Henry Timrod. And uh, Henry Timrod was the poet laureate of the Confederacy. And I just thought it was was crazy that uh, I had both grown up in South Carolina and was studying poetry at a graduate school and had never heard of this person. Mm. Um, and then I, it got even worse because I went back and he had composed the South Carolina State Hymn as well. So um, I wrote this poem about that experience. It's a poem that has taken on a lot of new meaning for me. Uh, the central metaphor in the poem has to do with the birth of a child. And, and uh, I wrote it, I guess, when I was 22 or 23. And since I've had a child of mine, the, the whole resonance of the poem is different than it was. Uh, for me at another point in my life. Uh, so in the bell yard, Trinity Cathedral, Columbia, South Carolina. Below the low hang of live oak and palmetto, among gravestones grown green with envy of the living, among the three Wade Hamptons wound in wrought iron, I sit in the shade of Henry Timrod and listen to the slow, long ringing of the bells. These words will rub off our minds like epitaphs exposed to salt and wind. An ode, a state hymn, all of his I know, ride on a tide of melody and ceremony. Before the even song in a slanting sun, what in time is more than words or names? What will last beyond the grave and gravestone, survive divorce, Names split like granite, survive our need to sign ourselves in stone. What things in this world are blessed without the sweat of permanence? What is left of the Christian? The decay of a fertile grave, a cathedral filled with air, the transubstantiation which is past, the consubstantiation which cannot feed us, or the echo of a day at the battery in 1867 in the mind of an old man whose father's father was there at the dedication to the Confederate dead, who took in the same salt and sweat air that Timrod breathed? At what point do we begin to say without saying enough? This house to house religion is a museum, a reliquary of a faith drowned in the swamps of nouns and verbs, inarticulate, confined, ephemeral, ignoble. Even the Hamptons have turned to stone, and Henry Timrod, Confederate, Episcopal, is voiceless. What options have we left ourselves? 
who would score a mass for the end of time? And in the echo, in the bell yard, fingers running the rivulets of the gravestones, of ourselves we make cathedrals, not from our words as Wordsworth wanted, but from here where my hands that hold you are two chapels and the green glaze of my eyes is slow stained glass, where my arms around you are a flying buttress and the cross of my body on your body is the long central hall of a cruciform church rising higher and higher to my chest clerestory, the pattern of aisles, each ripple of skin, a row of pews, your rolling parted wave of wood burnished hair, a choir, and in the great bell tower, my mouth resounds with the ring of a kiss calling forth the pregnant tension among three people before the beginning of the word, this tension which will suffice the unspoken sound of two restless tongues in primal eloquence awaiting the arrival of a child. As I think about painting, and Matt made a comment that this was one of the most recent paintings, and yet I find it interesting that we begin in the middle, which is perhaps sometimes said to be an ending, when we look at the light and the feeling of the nave of a church being represented within the body of nature, the notion of the water running through all things and over those dark waters, those rocks, the idea of a figure moving upriver into an illuminate vista, which by no accident has the rem reminiscence of a nave. It also relates to an early painting I did when I was working with Bill Commodore and Alessandro Comini and Anne-Marie Carr, people at Southern Methodist University noted Byzantine iconographer Anne-Marie Carr was commenting upon the notion of Hadrian's Villa, and I'll get to that one in a moment, but I think it's kind of somewhat interesting that we can start something in all earnestness, which is a kind of a battle when we paint, and then many years, 17 years later, those urgencies are still repeating themselves like tide unto a shore, or the flow of water in a river. So back to the notion of rivers divide, I think in many ways we become divided I think there's ways of looking at life, Old Testament, New Testament. We look at all through, you know, one period versus another. But I think those elements of light, the qualities of light coming out of darkness, those struggles which happen in painting, which for me are connected to rhythms in nature, cyclical patterns of destruction in nature, the whole idea that we have the very simple, uh, the quotidian versus the mythic, uh, the darkness, light, eviscerating darkness and eradicating it, moving from one state to the other. So paintings in their own way are transportive, and I think all of these deal with the idea of the art about art, which is the history of our mark making, uh, the modernist era, but also combining with the idea of art about life, which is the travail, the journey, the moving through that faith that we share and those things that we are thinking about as artists when light overtakes darkness when color makes sense of the banality of gray and the richness of gray. So that painting is about a personal journey and again from a dream, but not to be so specific with a narrative that it couldn't be anyone else's journey, that in a way as a post symbolist that we don't dangle the viewer in a sense of mystery before a painting that's a threshold of a stage which only promises the drama to come, that's lit exquisitely but doesn't tell the actual narrative in a sequential manner like the poetry that Matt's been reading, that falls like lightning from heaven, that illuminates the darkest moment of our existence. To me, those are the keys that painting give us through color, through form, through its ability to have a discourse of destruction to creation, like our own life. In essence, the replication of the prayer of Trinity. So for me, the, the notion of the river, the moving upriver, the river's divide is something that we have within each of us. Thank you. That's it. Uh, I'm going to actually move starting with this painting. The next uh, two poems, the last two poems are a set of poems written um, in response to uh, the scripture in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Yes. Uh, one of the things I think that's actually kind of disappointing in uh, modern life with the loss of the ubiquity of the King James Bible is that language being common. And one of the, the, I'm sure many of you have had this experience, one of the things that as I grow older I notice is the weird interchange uh, 
that books have in relation to how one perceives the reality around them. Uh, I, in one of these poems, I'm, I talk about great expectations and, and having read great expectations in a small southern town, the only images I had to imagine it in my head were with that town itself. And so, but it works both ways. And so then uh, even last time I was there, I keep thinking, oh, that's the house that, that, that I used as the model for what all the houses in Dickens look like, or something like that. Um, but a lot of, a lot of what I, I do, particularly with the, the King James Bible, but also with the, the blues or um, country music or uh, South Carolina beach music, these kinds of, of art, songs, these things that, you, you, that came to you early that come out in weird ways and affected how you interacted with the world that was around. That's what these next two poems are, are about. Um, so this first one, In My Father's House, uh, is paired with Michael's poem uh, painting Industrial Garden from, uh, nope, sorry, from Lifeline from 1996, uh, oil, oil painting. Um, in my father's house. In the beginning, God created the world to the adagio of Mozart's clarinet concerto in A major. All opens before me, an isosceles sky, rent cotton, the white steeple of a Baptist church. This is the setting for all stories. But how to make you understand, to be understood, a janitor fingering for a flipped breaker in the basement of a school. Books become latitudes and latitudes books, like remembering the town you grew up in, the house in which Miss Havisham lived. I will now list the blessings I've received. A swift kick in the ass, synthesis, association, allergies, a cup half empty and half full. A squared plus B squared equals C squared, the lines of earth. But here is the thing about the prodigal son. Who didn't raise him right to begin with? My father once set the church roof on fire with roaming candles on the 4th of July, dead pumpkins melting behind the shed all year. My grandfather, surprisingly heavy in his casket like a ripe melon dug from the vine. Life was grass stains in the sap from trees. There were open fields, then a sign in an open field for sale, then a field with a nursing home in it, then a nursing home with the memory of a cotton field. Life in the wasteland of the chestnut blight, knowing enthusiasm means God in us, knowing nothing but the sand hills and the edisto, memory, imagination. No one comes to the Father but through me. Nice. That's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> and it's an interesting juxtaposition in Laura, beautiful placement of that. The painting Lifeline originates from my fifth year of life when I sat on the knee of a godparent. Some of you knew Dr. Chilman, and he always told me about but when you want older someday and have an opportunity to visit Italy, this idea of spherical perfection that was in so much of what Adrian built. You think of the Pantheon, you think of those cupolas that were in the pleasure pond of 50, 50 miles kind of north and over from Rome. You find this incredible expanse of classical structure. These, and this was from the pleasure pond. But as I remembered the pleasure pond as I was entering graduate, moving to another city and working with these people that I hadn't known very much. I kept thinking about what Dr. Chilman kept saying about spherical perfection, about water being that catalyst which often sets apart great design, which we live in and through and of. And in one way, the idea of my dream in this sequence was on a rock, and I was trying to save my son, who had to remain in Houston. So it's really an emotional thing for me, the fact that you can be a parent 200 miles away or thousand miles away and yet as our children grow in any public school there's always the threats and the abuses and the drugs and things that swarm around them. So my, the nightmare was of dreaming that I was on a rock in this classical villa in the middle of a pleasure pond 
holding a lifeline to my son who was bobbing in this beautiful water that wasn't so beautiful. So the presence of ambiguity, the faith that it took to make that step, that courage of conviction to create one's own journey, to have that adventure, was really the inspiration of the painting. But the more and more I painted, it became less about the lifeline and more about the light vapor from the water taking over the architecture. While all the while the remnants of architecture were erased, the spherical perfection remained. This feeling of the circumference, this roundness that I found to be really a quintessential design element. So for me, the painting really resides on what I discover as I'm painting it and 17 years later. You know, it's interesting, the collector that owns this is a long list of, who's actually had a degree in art, a long list of things which he asked me, did I place in the painting? My answer to that is, I'm not so sure they were placed there, but that you found them there. So maybe that's what Matisse said about painting and even poetry, that that's the most affecting, the most powerful, the most giving for the longest period of time impacts the viewer, it becomes the best work. And water is again inherent and, and repeated in what I what I am interested in revealing. Thank you. The uh, last of the poems um, is paired with this final painting, Industrial Garden, from 2012-2013, also on uh, oil, and it's the follow-up poem to the last poem. Um, uh, if it if it were not so, I would have told you. <coughs> If it were not so, I would have told you. Memory moves through monastic silence. I go room by room, depression glass, lazy Susan, paper Santa in a domed display. But still, there is no sound or smell, no aloe vera or touch of whiskey in the wood, not even the singular descending cheer of purple martins from the Martin house or, deeper still, a well-tempered claver, the carol of the bells, the tintinabulation of our DNA. I practice patience and see what in the stillness I can recall, a square field, a rhombus of cotton, the world as Euclid viewed it, sand hills, red clay, and loam, the body of memory, its back stretched long across the bottom land, the bloated carcass of thought floating up from a black river, or even a disembodied secret mouthing out tintagel early on Easter morning alone in my room. There is a new shadow on a window pane, a wren attempting to come inside, haint in the body of a small brown bird, the woman who passed away in this very room. But I know better. The bird is a moving memory in continual change. The driveway was gravel, and then it was not. The sycamore tree in the church alley sloughed bark, and then it didn't. The shed without power was black with dust and clutter, like the circular web of a brown recluse, and then it was opened. Or, to take a different view, I read Journey to the Center of the Earth reclined in the music room of a house I no longer know. But the wren that knocks the glass is not a wren. She is a sparrow and lights on a limb beyond my kitchen window. She lights on the lip of a puddle of mud in the bosom of the earth, now turned to its own purpose. Beautiful poem and an interesting ending because <clears throat> I, I believe what some things that Matt's poetry and my painting also share is this notion of connection in a familial sense to those things we've lived through. This painting directly relates to remembrances that I have as a very young boy when my father illustrated a book for Galveston and one for Houston, The Feast Years. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, George Fornell could have been the writer. But it was memories that I have of going into a, a paddy off of I-45 near Galveston with an ink pen drawing as he was sketching for the xylographic plates that he would later cut. And in those days, it was pre-9-11 and pre-restriction to our petrochemical vistas which, and factories, which can be quite beautiful at night. And we would come in in the evening, and he was trying to capture the light. And I remember these 
these what seemed to me blown out, bombed out buildings, and yet these trestles going in in a rocky road near this grass growing, this kind of odd verdant gardens that seemed to be oddly placed. And I just, glimpses of childhood and glimpses of what we remember often sustain the imagination to procreate and to be a partner with a viewer in discovering paintings that may not have the initial intention, but yet somehow come to a truth one way or another. And this particular painting, urban industrial garden, is an urban setting. It is, again, coastal, this coast, any coast and as if to make the dream even more confusing and confounding, there were these Etruscan sort of hovels that could have been house shapes in the dream near all of the installation and the buildings that were producing, the re refining the petrochemicals. And so I remember this light, this beautiful sulfuric kind of illumination in the evening. So what is an apocryphal kind of remembrance becomes very sweet and, and in a way tender and in a way important to remember and process one's childhood. So for me, it was a, a venture back in a dark evening with the lights flickering in the distance off of those machinery parts that for one person might think would be the end of the earth. And yet for me, it was the beginning of all things I loved. I, 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 I want to sort of follow that a little bit because I think as art has become more secular, uh, it's, it's begun to Art that deals explicitly with memory, uh, uh, even nostalgia, has sort of lost its, it's sort of considered bad art. And, and I think that's actually a symptom of, of part of the problem that we have in our, our contemporary understanding mm -hmm. of art. Like for me, and I, I think maybe, maybe Michael you would agree, the, the sense of nostalgia goes back to nostos and the idea of home. Mm -hmm. And the idea of searching for home goes back to the idea that our home was in Eden and we're not at home here. And there's, there's, that's the real tension in art is that we get these, these glimpses. Wordsworth calls them spots of time. The, these glimpses of significance, oftentimes in childhood, but not in a sort of a, not in sort of a cheesy romantic no. way as if childhood really? is morally better than, than mm -hmm. adulthood per se, but just, just, they're, they're stranger or more remembered because there's less sort of cluttering your, your mind there. But mm -hmm. these, these glimpses of significance that sort of, on one hand, bring us the clarity of wanting a sense of home and at mm -hmm. the same time the homelessness absolutely. of not, not having. To me, that, that seems to be where my art sort of really centers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The verdancy of a sense of time. This whole notion that we're in the life age that we assume as painters, as poets, as sculptors, and that we, we can't really get away from the past. It becomes part of a past qua past. It becomes, a nay, nay, the future of some way that we, you know, painting is dead. Uh, maybe the word was dead in some ways as well, but no, it isn't. I mean, how can we live in the South and not think of well, Gothic and Faulkner? <laughs> what, what, what does Quentin Compson say in Absalom, Absalom? The past is not dead. It's not even past. It's not even <laughs> past. We're stuck in the middle of the beginning. But, uh, you know, that's true about critical theory because I know I see Richard and I see Sharon Capriva and so many friends that we know and love. But we think about critical theory in the abyss that this kind of Marxian uh, structure of criticism has kind of given the girth and weight and the feeling of guilt for actually looking at God's light in nature, just looking at nature, period. And I think there is probably that, that sequitur that pulls maybe in some way poetry, but certainly painting, uh, into its proclamation of its death prematurely. I mean, I think we, we begin again, and it is a battle and a war, and I think that the real art becomes to take those things that could be sentimental, but memorialize them in such a way where they become universal, they become, of a, they become essential to survive a verdant era, well, there's, a there's, splenetic era. There's nothing wrong with sentiment. I mean, without no. sentiment, you don't have, have right. art. The, you know, the, the question is, what are you doing with the sentiment, and, right. and what is the context of it, and are you using it for manipulation or, right. or not. It, it, Commodore said once years ago about glazing, he said it's awfully elegic. And then he thought for a moment, he said, well, so is painting. The whole existence that we're in refers back to those periods. So I think it was a wise comment about the importance of very early things being made new. What do you think, Jim? 
Well, first of all, I think a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, before um, I open it up to questions from the audience, and I hope you, you all have some questions Please. for Michael and for Matt, I want to say just a few things um, about the installation, some practical things. I owe a big uh, debt of gratitude to Laura Kraft, mm -hmm. who is very... Uh, worked with me on this show. I mean, Laura obviously has her gallery. I have mine. We, we do our own thing, but in this case, we really collaborated uh, in the sense that we decided that five paintings would be enough for mm -hmm. this space. Mm -hmm. um, and we also decided that uh, five poems or sections of poems should go next to them. Laura came up with mm -hmm. this brilliant idea of working with these, this format. I had seen something similar years ago, but I have, it's uncommon to see the way the sections of the poems were chosen, which we both kind of collaborated on. We took sections of Matt po Matt's poems, and then Laura had them done in different texts, or different fonts, as you'll see, and colors, for that matter. And so we had a lot of fun with playing with the poet and the painter's work in this installation. And as Michael showed you a minute ago, mm -hmm. by downing the lights, you can do it one more time. Yeah, for, for those people that came, came later. It came a little I later. Cream. This is how it would be if you come into the space when it's open, we decided we'd make it very dramatic. Um, and um, so, uh, since we didn't have light here on the table, we, we needed to talk, but um, anyway, uh, it's really fun to do something like this. Uh, poetry in the worlds of poetry and the worlds of painting have been uh, like, um, like brothers mm -hmm. throughout the history of art, mm -hmm. uh, all the great Critics, many of the great critics that we that we know are, are more famous as poets than they they are as critics. But uh, they th there's this interesting collaboration mm -hmm. that happens. It's not a true collaboration. It's a response. Thank, thank Two responses, one visually and one with uh, with literature. And uh, we're so lucky to have on our faculty here two uh, outstanding artists who uh, were happy to share um, their work with you today. And um, so with that, I would like to kind of open it up for questions. You can direct to um, any of us, really, but uh, specifically to Michael and Matt. Um, are there any questions you may have? Yes. Michael, yes. Your, your work, uh, which I, I said last week, uh -huh. um, I noticed that you're very selective uh, a couple of things, on your glazing, and on your uh, saturating your, uh, your colors. And, uh, and also, you, you play around with the three-dimensional aspect of creating a atmospheric environment, but then you use certain areas of flat. Mm -hmm. And so, when you're working with your works, at what point do you start kind of fringing on, on, on you know, enhancing the flatness, and at the same time, making it blend with your I think in some ways that's a uh, really interesting question that, a very interesting question, but it also is a segwitter into Laura's other space in Gallery 220 where Jim and I have gone on an intensive study abroad, a quick uh, visit through uh, certain parts of Florence and Venice, and we were just scavenging for in churches for structure for architectonic shapes that we would use. So the answer to your question begins in that other room because their their drawings begin with twigs that my I, I found and sharpened as a you know college student and later Commodore had an oak tree luckily and gave me many of his sharpened. But the idea of plumbing a, a structure happens in the drawing. I had teachers and Richard Stout was one of them who said you must do many thumbnails at least five because. You could be, the, the sixth one could be the best way to work an idea out. So I'm a big believer in drawing first and in multiple thumbnails and then in larger drawings. Uh, so it, the structure begins there, but I think the painting becomes somewhat of a meditation or a battle. I mean, Picasso called it war, but it's too insignificant probably to call it a war. It's like many battles put together. And I, and I think that it comes in and out of focus. That, that very geometry that you start upon, broken can become more important than it is whole. 
I mean, when we think of Christ's cradle of thinking, let's look back at Hebrew poetry for a moment. If you look at the Psalms, or lamentation is filled with woe and dread, is it not? It's not a sanctuary for the weak of heart. It's a sanctuary for those that have a heart and believe. So I think the very enactment of a painting where we get into some trouble, like Rothko told Commodore is the, and told me, was the very beginning of how we make a painting. So the answer to your question is, it's not the beginning, it's not at the middle, and it may not be at the end. It may be a 10-year painting. It's when it's done. And that's when I settle that the geometry, that the structure is balanced properly with things that I find. So there's no clean answer, but it's wrapped up in the struggle. That's when we know we're painting. Yes, dear Richard. I, I, I keep having in my head uh, as, as this wonderful portrait was spread and looking at your paintings of um, uh, a film I saw last year, uh, The Tree of Life. I think there's something about uh, how Melnick uh, composes the views of the camera and the pacing of the activities that's being peculiarly from this part of the world. Uh, I mean, we all get it. Mm. I mean, not like the film as a whole, why we get those pieces. And there's a great stillness, a, a kind of a unique stillness that occurs in that film, which is very much like these pieces. Thank you. I'll have to really look at that. I remember the bliss of hearing Matt's first poetry reading in the museum next door. And I got so very excited, I kept texting him. I think his wife and my wife would were really it's about 4 a.m. But we kept texting, and he said, Michael, this is more insightful than my doctoral committee. You get these. So it, it was really, and immediately then, we kind of birthed this idea with Jim and Laura's blessing to try to have not an ekphrasis, because neither of us made work in a musical sense that had our words or visual imagery in tandem as the activity was happening. But it could have been, because I think those differences are the similarities, and they draw comparisons that are, make one think more. Yes, sir. Um, words and images, at least for me, often move you away from your emotions mm -hmm. uh, and enable you to think about them. This um, display seems to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, and I'm curious whether next to the art, the tags, which often pull us away from the painting and let us think about it, inform the painting, if this is intentional in that they seem to drop me back into the pool of emotion in the painting. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, as many of you, no, as you go to museums, all you have to do is stand in the gallery for an half, an half an hour and watch people come into the gallery. What do they do? They take a quick look at the painting and then they go right up to the label because they want mm -hmm. verbal mm -hmm. understanding of what mm -hmm. that artist was doing. And unfortunately, it's, it's sad, but in, in many, many cases, people spend more time just re reading the the, the, the basic information on a label than they actually do looking at the painting. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of a sensitive thing, even when Laura and I were first talking about this. Do we do the whole poem? Well, that would be, that might be too much. And, and that's why we just did a fragment for, for Matt. And, um, but I think if, if the work is powerful enough, in this case we really believe it is, both the poems and the paintings, that people, people will take that second and third look. And, and if you go to the big museums, that's why when you go to the Metropolitan and some of the big museums in America, or even the Manil, there may be only four paintings in a room, or three paintings, it's in, in, instead of 25. The old salon style of just let's fill the wall with art. Uh, that doesn't encourage really good, you know, thoughtful looking. So we're in hopes that people spend time with the poems and the, or in this case, the fragment of the poet, just reading those five lines mm -hmm. and how they interact with the paintings or play against the paintings or play with the paintings mm -hmm. is, is very, is, we think is important. Mm -hmm. I, I gotta say, I gotta pick on Michael a little bit. I don't know if y'all noticed this, Michael said something about his twig drawings. Right. You can tell Michael's reached such a high stage of mastery of painting that now he gets to 
to paint with twigs. That's, that, that, like, that, the comparable sense of this would be like if you were a hunter and you started hunting with a blunderbuss or, or a bow and arrow or, or just or, rocks or, or something. No, 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 quite the contrary. It only begins with a blunt twig. It, it, it definitely goes into hair as another other more sensitive material to, to, to provide a, a distribution of that, of that uh, bounty. I, I have a comment question. Uh, I've had the a good fortune of working across the hall from Dr. Boylston and getting to know a real live poet uh, on a very frequent basis. We have serious discussions about his methodology. And since so many of you are visual artists, I was wondering if Matt could talk about the process of mm -hmm. creating a poem. Because he's come Absolutely. in and gone, this is almost a poem. And I'm like, what do you mean it's it almost is. a poem? <laughs> so if you could just speak sure. to that. Okay. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I can. Um, I think there's a distinct difference between verse and poetry, and, and I think we have to first understand that. Verse is writing in meter. Uh, poetry is when the verse captures life to it, or it, it, it has, I, I like to think of it has the spirit in it. Um, it's, I mean, we've all seen this where, y'all have seen, the play Amadeus with, you know, that, that's, it's not that Salieri wrote bad music, it's just not Mozart. So that's sort of what I think about the difference between verse and poetry. So what my methodology is, is I, I typically start a poem uh, oftentimes with a line from something. More often than not, it's something either from liturgy or scripture, but not necessarily. Sometimes it can be a, a line. I'm writing a series of poems right now on uh, uh, lines from 1950s R&B music that, that I grew up with. Um, and that will, the, in, in it's, it's both the image but also the music of the line that'll sort of start thinking. And I usually keep a notebook on me and I'll, I'll sort of jot down these ideas and at some point it then gets moved to a bigger notebook uh, in pencil, which I think is important. Uh, not for the erasing but the feel of it. It gets moved to a bigger note, but, but the, the poems are much more like building a house. They're much more like putting something together and taking different mm -hmm. bits and moving right. them around. And um, I typically go through, I don't know, maybe 100, 120 drafts of, of a poem uh, before it sort of gets to a stage where it starts to resume. But, but, but then you have to go back and you have to spend time with it and you have to read it out loud and you have to, it has to swing. It has to have a, um, one of the things that I'm most um, proud of in my poetry is, is, is its swinging quality. And, um, okay, yeah, and, and I think that's, uh, I learned that from, from my, my teacher, uh, James Dickey, that, that believed a poem is not necessarily what the poem says, it's, it's the rhythm of the poem. And, and those rhythms, we didn't make those rhythms. Uh, those rhythms were, were, were God's rhythms. They were made by, we discover them. Um, and we, we, the role of the artist in part is to help people hear and see and experience God's rhythms more deeply. Uh, and in ways they didn't know at first. It's to give people language to understand their own experience in ways that are deeper. One of the things that, that's, that I always start poetry classes with that drives students nuts is, nuts is I, I, I firmly do not believe that poetry is about self-expression. Um, I think it may be about self-expression for the poet necessarily, but, but, the, but the role is a relationship that one has with you. I, when, it, when someone reads my poems, I want, I want them to start, their minds to start being, thinking of the things they grew up with or, or whatever. And experiencing their own set of experiences and emotions in communion with my poem. It's a, uh, it's no, uh, art is not a form of pity. Back on the artist. Um, so, to me, you have to live with a poem for a long, long time before you hit on those rhythms. And it's that, uh, it's that rhythm or that image that seems to be natural, where, where you sort of feel like this was presented to you. I mean, it comes through hard work, but, but there is a certain sense of the spirit inside us and in inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, rarely does it come immediately, but it can. It's more of a sense, it, it's very much like prayer in a certain sense. It's like, 
You, you have to discipline yourself with the regularity of prayer to make yourself ready when God does speak to you directly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's kind of what art does. Um, so my process is, is a process of combination. It's, it's more like sculpture, I think it is, than like linear writing. Um, uh, it's a process where um, uh, in my own poems, they, they, they tend, they're not, I don't think they're exactly collage poems, but they're, they're, they're poems of, of episodes and images that are sort of put together and united through both rhythm and theme. Um, so uh, they're, they're also, I worry sometimes too, though, I've spent so long reading my poems out loud, I worry that if you read them on the page, they have no music. <laughs> it, it's hard for a, for, a, for a poet to sort of see that. But that, That's the notion of the self-criticism that we all have to go through. Uh, many of my great teachers in the past have said, read Rilke, Letters to a Young Poet. And when you think about one of the chapters in it where it talks about you're quite, quite unassailably right about your suspicions regarding that critic of to the younger poet that we're mentioning, he said only love, gestation, and perseverance really are the equipment where art's plumb from the soul. And I think painting is a lot like the wordsmithing that Matt's talking about. There is a visual cadence, there's light and dark, there's the content that's sublimated that comes out after you're finished. But there is that struggle, that going back to and editing and going over and over again. So it's a... It's I don't a, think it's any different than any other art. I mean, right. the way, a, the way either a composer writes a work of music exactly. or a, a, a musician prepares a piece of music, it's that constant going back and coming right. you know, forward and, and um, so on. I, I, it Good is question. surprising, though, for students to sort of understand that you don't, the poem's not finished when you've written the sonnet. Like, it may be a perfectly good verse sonnet, but it may not yet be a poem. It, it, doesn't, have, it doesn't breathe, it doesn't swing, it doesn't ring true uh, to the ear, it doesn't ring right. And you can, you can, I mean, you can develop your palate, too, to appreciate this. This is why we read uh, uh, as artists. Uh, artists read weird, by the way. Don't, don't ever listen to anything an artist tells you about another, another writer. They often say the most interesting things, but they just read weird. They look for stuff they can use, and they have weird relationships with, <laughs> with, with literature. And, and I'm sure painters are the same, oh, the same way. But. Mining for visuals. Yeah. Uh, I remember uh, a professor, a friend of ours, an artist who went civil. I've read all of these books in the library, and I'm giving them all away now. Mm -hmm. D. Wolf. She was talking about just getting rid of those type of influences that are already in you. Yeah. Now, just gestating with them. My great dream in life, it drives my students crazy too, though, but my great dream is to get to read so deeply that I end up reading one or two books only for the rest of my life. Right. Uh, and to find the books that, that, that you can do that with. Mm -hmm. I'm not a go broad mm -hmm. kind of person, mm -hmm. I'm much more go, go deep. Repetition, go deeper. Kierkegaard. Matt has an awful lot of books in his office. So. <laughs> when I, get to, when I discover grain, those two, take that as with a when grain I discover salt. those two works, you're welcome to come and take, take the other one. Yeah, never volunteer to help him move his office. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a challenge. Um, uh, I think there's a question. One more, uh, another oh, yes. few questions. Yes. This is Tim Bartell. He's also a published poet, so this is an unfair, <laughs> unfair question. I have, a gl I have a glib answer and then I have a trick. The glib answer is the poem better be really good. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I actually think this is more honest. I really do. Uh, you know, in the, in the Baptist tradition, we put, uh, and the tradition I was raised in, we put a lot of emphasis on memorizing Scripture so that Scripture, uh, so that you have it at the time that you need it. What we, what I don't think my Sunday school teacher is quite understood was how, what that meant and how I would need it. Um, I, I am much more of a medievalist than this. I, I do think scripture has, has at least four levels of meaning. And, and one of those levels of meaning is both allegorical and another is mystical. Mm -hmm. And so um, you, you take a line from Paul out of context 
I, I don't see it as out of context because I see it as living with the Word of God in a very personal uh, way that is bringing you back to the Word. The, the, the literal meaning or the theological meaning of the Scripture is, is part of it. But, you know, when I perform a funeral service um, and the um, a prayer book may not necessarily have the 23rd Psalm in either the King James or the Wycliffe translation, people get mad. People get mad that haven't been to church in 20 years. Um, there, is, there is real meaning to the rhythm of Scripture itself. Uh, and, and really, in the New Testament, this is really kind of, kind of a complicated New Testament question. Because the New Testament is more beautiful in the King James English than it is in the New Testament Greek, in much of the, 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 the New Testament. Um, you know, we have heightened the language in a certain way that is against what the document itself seems to imply. Um, I think, though, part of it has to do with, it, it's, we have to remember, too, it's not just Scripture. It's Scripture and the Spirit. Um, so I also, I also, if you notice in my poems, I don't make meaning interpretations of the Scripture. And so I think that's, that I'm, I'm not writing theology. I'm not, not claiming the scripture says a particular thing or, or whatever. I, I'm having a reaction to the way that I think many of us experience life where these, these things that we experienced early, these songs we heard, these books we read, the, the friends, we, they, they, they inform how we view the rest of life. And for someone that sort of grew up in the Bible Belt, thankfully, um, in, in a church that used the, the, the King James Bible, again, thankfully, um, that, that my brain is wired along those rhythms. Now, in fairness to your question about Paul, that's not the King James translation of Paul, but um, uh, I, that, that's what I would, 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 would say. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Any more questions? Because this is my painting, and there's a nail in my living room now where it went. I miss it. I live with it every day. I love it. Twelve years ago, Michael Collins said, you don't have one of my paintings, you need one. And of course, I replied, I can't afford one. And then he went to his studio and came back and said, this is your painting. I didn't select it. He selected it for me. But it's all the more meaningful because... <laughs> um, because I knew his father very well, and his father had a particular shape to his eye, and I see his father's face in there. So when I read this poem of Matt's saying, uh, I can't remember a thing about his face, but I hear his voice every day, every hour, I know Michael feels that connection with his father, so the poem seemed very tied to the painting in my eyes. So that's how that one got paired. I'd like to thank all the collectors, too, who actually allowed these to be given back for the show. It's a hard thing when works go away into museums or private collections, even corporate. Forget that, if that ever is the case. These are all privately collected. And I want to thank the collectors for being so generous, allowing them to be on this campus. Uh, really, well, we, we also need to thank, I mean, I, I, I just need to say it yeah, as well, because we need to thank um, uh, Dr. Sloan and the HBU community. Yep. Uh, not too long ago at a typical Baptist university, something like this would not necessarily have been <coughs> encouraged. Absolutely. And, the and uh, so, you know, the vision of, of, of our president, Dr. Sloan, it, it shows you what one person's vision can make a difference across the entire religious landscape of higher education. And, 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 that it, and this is a, a fruit of that, that vision. And that it elicited an emotional response from the deepest level. That also was very exciting when you know your president and the first lady of our university really understand 
<clears throat> the pairing and what we're trying to say with the visual art and with the word. So that's a, a we'll be most thankful for them. And I'd also like to thank Matt for this pairing and Laura and Jim for the countless hours of having the pleasurable duty of perusing Matt's poetry to pick the perfect sequiturs and connective tissue that would, would resonate with elements in my painting. So, and, and lastly, thank all of you all for being here. And there is another part of this exhibit, and it's in this gallery, 220. And we'd love to invite you to come and see drawings and sketches of Jim Edwards and of my work. But it would give you an idea of where sketches develop, since there was a question about drawing, where the sketches begin that lead to paintings. And I, I mean, I'd, I'd almost wanted to ask Matt, do trash, there's a trash can, but you're on a word processor or a dog, <laughs> accompany the, the, the structure of building the poem. But artists are just notorious yeah. for having piles of paper that don't succeed. This is why I don't type a poem until very, very, very late. late in the process. And the pencil is, mm -hmm. yeah. I see you penciling in the book from now on. I'll, Unfortunately, I, I write longer poems, but I also have to recopy everything I wrote on the poem up to them before you can move forward. So it's a, it's a <laughs> slow, <laughs> slow process. process. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, <laughs>